Okie doke. While we wait for everyone to, uh, to arrive in, before we kick off properly this evening, uh, I would of course like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting here this evening, uh, wherever we are across uh, Australia. Jane and I, we're on the lands of the Gadigal people of the, of the Eora Nation in, uh, in the middle of Sydney. And our special guest this evening, Chris Bonner, is on Darug land out in the northwest of Sydney. Uh, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend a particularly warm welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here this evening. Wherever we are this evening, we are all on First Nations land and sovereignty of that land was never ceded. So welcome back to week three of Reasonings with Jane. We're really starting to rack up uh, these, uh, these webinars. It's wonderful. Um, I'm Hannah, Hannah Ma. I am once again facilitating the Q&A at the end of this evening's webinar. And of course, as always, our host tonight is author, social commentator, and Reason Australia's lead candidate for the Senate in New South Wales, Jane Caro. Welcome, Jane. Thanks, Hannah. Lovely to be here. Lovely to be talking to my old mate, Chris. <laughs> Yes, Chris is our, our, um, our wonderful special guest tonight. Uh, Chris Bonner is a former secondary school principal, an education advocate and a writer. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> so Chris and Jane have actually previously published two books together on education. And Chris's latest book, Waiting for Gonski, How Australia Failed Its Schools, which he co-wrote with Tom Greenwell, uh, dissects Australia's attempt to reform education funding and offers a few solutions to help change education for the better in our country. Uh, and of course, as always, at the end of the webinar tonight, there will be a quick Q&A section. If you would like to ask questions, you there at home, then you can pop them into the special Q&A section. Uh, not in the chat, you can use the chat for chatting, use the Q&A section for questions and answers. And, uh, and I will leave you now, so everyone sit up straight, eyes forward, and I'll <laughs> hand you over to our education masterminds. Take it away. Thank you, Hannah. I'm afraid there are no whiteboards or chalkboards uh, in this uh, where I am. Nevertheless, uh, Chris spent a fair amount of his time in front of both, I should imagine. Um, how long were you uh, uh, an educator in schools for, Chris, all told? Jane, I've lost count, but then again, I've been retired 15 years, so I've probably done that deliberately, you know, but I think about, oh, about 40 years, 38 years from memory. Yeah, and you're, the last school you were principal of was Davidson High School, correct? Davidson High School, and before that, Asquith Boys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're also the president of the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council for some time. Yeah, five and years, is, uh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. yeah. So there's not a lot happening in schools that you don't know all about. <laughs> and, in, and indeed, in 2007, you and I wrote a book together. In fact, we first, did. Yeah, first book I'd ever written, but you'd written some geography textbooks. I remember that. <laughs> the Stupid Country, we called it, How Australia is Dismantling Public Education. That book we really wrote, I think, as a warning, didn't we? We um, did. Mm. Yeah. Do you think the warning worked? Have things gotten better or have they gotten worse? <laughs> no, look, I think, well, they've, they've got worse. Um, basically, and, but we were right to do that book and I'm glad we did because we raised a whole lot of things that have uh, actually um, <clears throat> transpired since then. And we brought those, those perspectives, you know, you had a parental and I had a teacher perspective on schools, so it was... It, we, I think we were well grounded there, mm, mm. and I know I know in both cases our lived experience of schools was telling us that something's going really wrong here, mm. um, and that our weird sort of public-private hybrid system was was increasing the differences and the chances of kids that were well off and kids that weren't. Yeah, um, yeah, and and that's what we've seen to come to pass ever since. I mean, Australia still has a huge equity gap between the kids who walk through the gate with plenty of social capital from, you know, well-resourced, well-educated families mm. in comparison to those who walk in through the school gate with very little of that. I think at the time, Jane, we could never have imagined that it would deteriorate. No. That all that would get worse. Um, and, that's, and that's been a fairly frightening experience in so many ways. Um, because you could think, you know, that it wouldn't get worse. 
Mm. Um, but we were, um, <clears throat> we, I mean, we'll get onto this, but the Gonski mm. Review, what it achieved and what it didn't achieve has been a big part of that. Yeah, because we got our hopes up, didn't we? We thought things might get better mm. and that we might start funding. Because because basically, let me just encapsulate what I think is the, the central problem of funding education, which then becomes the central problem of education um, in, our, in this country. And that is that we actually put the most money, and I'm not talking about sources, but the most money in total behind the kids who need the least and the least money total behind the kids who actually need the most uh, resources. So we're, we're actually, you know, governments love to tell us, oh, we've, you know, increased the funding to schools by this much as if that has any effect. But it has no effect if what you're doing is giving it to the wrong kids. I mean, a dressage centre with the great, greatest will in the world, I'm sure it's great fun for the girls and boys who like horse riding, but is it going to add anything to our educational attainment? Mm. Yeah, look, we are overfunding. We actually spend a lot of money on education in this, in this country. And politicians are constantly bleating that we're spending a lot of money and not getting much in return in terms of student results. But of course, the money's not going. It's like if I had two glasses of water, one was half full and one was full, and I kept adding water to the full glass. You're not going to get uh, much out of that. But if you add glass water to the half full glass, you're obviously getting an improvement, the value added and so on. And so we, we are spending it in the wrong directions. And, and neither the Gonski Review nor the Carmel Review going right back into the 1970s made an, made an impact. We just resumed business as usual after the Gonski Review, within months even. Yeah, within months. Yeah. I mean, there was some extra money that went into um, a lot of public schools, particularly those teaching very disadvantaged kids because of the uh, loadings for kids with a specific disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And I dare say a lot of that money was uh, very gratefully received. I know that a lot of principals being wise to the ways of extra money coming to public schools immediately put it into things that, that couldn't be taken away like commercial kitchens and science laboratories, <laughs> like actual <laughs> nail to the walls so that no one can take it off them. Um, yeah, even yeah. if what those kids might have needed was specialist programs or more support teachers, because those people, those things can always be taken away from you again, and that's the problem. Yeah, I remember you and I wrote an article when the Gosky Review came out, and because the review was going to fund the needy students, Mm. A substantial loading of funding going to needy, needy students. At the time, we we thought, and it was a reasonable thing to think, mm. that uh, this would sort of create a balance between schools, that the, the schools that were funded the least or we, when kids had the greatest needs would, would be properly funded, and that would create an incentive for schools to actually enrol mm. some of the more of the strugglers. But it didn't happen. Yeah. And the reason it didn't happen is that the funding, basically, was was hijacked in a sense, hijacked uh, partly by the by the stipulation enforced on Julia Gillard that no school should lose any money at all, no school school should lose a dollar. So it meant that the Gonski Review had to catch up, had to increase the total amount of funding, so that the least funded schools was, would eventually get somewhere. But and um, they did that, and they did that to appease the richest schools. So they actually increase the expense of the whole system because the only way they could help the poorest and most disadvantaged yes. children yes. was by protecting the privilege of the richest yes. and most advantaged children. Well, I mean, it's fascinating. Absolutely. And, and the other thing, Jane, is that I didn't realise so much at the time is that really the high-fee Protestant schools had, <clears throat> in effect, they had an alliance with the, with the Catholic system. And in the Catholic system, in fairness, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of those schools were still quite low funded, mm. but there was this alliance so that when funding, when funding claims were made and funding increased, the high fee Protestant schools were there with their hands out as well. So they sort of shielded themselves behind the Catholic system in a sense, because it worked to the advantage of both. Mm. Um, and to make a breakthrough there, we have to break that alliance. Yeah. Well, you. You pointed out in numerous articles, and one in particular that I quote a lot, where you point out that it has now gotten to the point where there are some mostly Catholic schools, but some 
Christian and um, other denomination mm. schools that now get as much public funding per student and in some cases more public funding per student than the similar public school down the road or in the next suburb. Now, that is, is relatively new. There was some of that at the time of Gonski, but really the panel didn't pay close attention to the, the fact that that was happening. And I always cite Goldman as a wonderful example of this. Now, don't get me wrong, on, a, it, on average, public school students get funded at much higher levels, but of course, public schools <clears throat> teach the most expensive kids in the most expensive locations mm. from the most needy families. So obviously they're gonna get funded, but when you compare schools, they're enrolling, generally enrolling similar students. Because we've got to remember that state aid to church schools rolled out, or the symbolic beginning, in a sense, was Goldman, when uh, the um, uh, the uh, Catholic community there said, all right, if you're not going to give us any money to help our schools, we'll send them to your schools. Mm. And, and that, that was 66 at the height of the baby boom, wasn't it? 62, 62. 62, bit, uh, Mind you, mind you, it was a rolling, it was a rolling campaign. Um, and then, uh, so governments obviously responded by saying, oh my goodness, you know, this could cost us a fortune. Mm. So that actually established a bit of an urban myth that, uh, you know, having private schools saves the public purse. Well, to an extent, it may have at that, at that time, but that, gradually, that rap actually rapidly diminished. And by the turn of the century, it was clear that the non-gov sector was getting a substantial amount of public money. Mm. Now I cite Goldman as a wonderful example, because if they tried that on again, and send all the kids from the Catholic schools to Goulburn's public schools, the saving to the Australian taxpayer would be $2 million a year. <laughs> <laughs> it would actually cost us less. It would cost less. And there's so many examples because we have, in Australia, we have, we have choice of schools. Now to have choice of schools, you've got to duplicate the number of schools that you have. You actually have to have more schools than you need. So of course, in every little town in Australia, you have the local public school and the local Catholic school. And I did a couple of random, actually I chose Adelong in New South Wales, which is near where I grew up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, uh, and you can work out what would happen if you merged the two schools, how much you would save. And I think from memory it was about $150,000 a year, which if, if it ever happened, you could plow back into the local school and the local community, mm -hmm. um, instead of having this ridiculous duplication of school. Now, <clears throat> I know there's more to it than that, and, and, and some people prefer a Catholic education. But this probably, I don't know, this is the time, but to take us back to when public education was established and what we did right and what we did wrong. But we, yeah, we can get to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think the thing is that some people may prefer a Catholic education, some people may prefer a, a Muslim education or Jewish education, but we're the only country which goes around paying um, huge amounts of money for people to have that kind of choice. The one thing I think, we are by far the most generous funders of private schools in the world. No, no other country comes within cooey of us. It, it's quite a peculiar system that we have developed here. But and, and the one thing I think that Gonski actually did really achieve was it did change the rhetoric. It didn't actually change what governments did, but it mm. changed the rhetoric because prior to Gonski, um, the whole central tenant of our, our education system was about parental choice, providing parental choice. Um, my problem with that was always very simple. If you make parental choice the centre of your public education system or your education system, you can only entrench underprivilege and overprivilege because... No child is disadvantaged through any of their own doing. They're disadvantaged because they've been born into a family where, for whatever reason, the parents are, are, are less able to negotiate their way through the society. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. if you make what parents choose for their children the be-all and end-all, end then wealthier, more advantaged parents will simply pass on their wealth and more and advantage to their kids. That's fine. No one minds that. What they mind is that, that then holds the other children down in underprivilege with no way of yeah. getting out. <clears throat> yeah, because you see, choice in Australia comes at a cost. Hmm. So that means then, then that parents that are choosing are paying. And um, the impact of that is that basically non-government schools, because they charge fees, uh, are attracting a high SES enrolment profile. Mm. Now, the, the critical thing about that, and of course, leaving the, the free schools, because it's a fee versus free situation, leaving mm. the 
preschools <clears throat> and, and catering for those who can't afford to, to pay. Now, if you build a system around affordability, the choice is about affordability, you're going to create, in fact, if we sat down 40 years ago and say, look, let's create a, a social apartheid system of schools, you know, we mm. did it the best possible way. Because yeah. then we have one set of schools that uh, you pay to go in, and obviously in the end it rolls up a much higher SES profile of kids, and another school that has, in the end, a much lower SES profile of students. Now, the critical importance of that is that Gonski didn't discover, but Gonski emphasised the impact of having a large number of disadvantaged, a large number of strugglers in disadvantaged schools. Mm -hmm. We all know that student achievement overwhelmingly is linked to family background. Mm -hmm. But what's more important than that is the SES profile of peers in the schools that the kids attend. <clears throat> so if you've got a system that pulls out the most advantaged kids and puts them, crowds them together in advantaged schools and leaves the strugglers literally in a class of their own, it's had a massive impact on overall Australian achievement, school achievement. It's the elephant in the room, Jane. It's lumbering around and we're even very good at tiptoeing around its droppings, for goodness sake. Mm. We avoid that issue. Yeah. And it, it, um, the avoidance actually reached diabolical proportions. Every new Minister for Education, federally and even state, will do anything, will do anything at all disguised as school reform rather than address that central problem yeah. until we address that central problem we're in strife yeah. because oh, even the, even the efforts that ministers for education made to introduce reforms at the school level they won't get anywhere while ever we're crowding the strugglers together in disadvantaged schools mm -hmm. it becomes very expensive they're not achieving at those levels the role models have gone the teaching situation is very is far more difficult teacher expectations are inevitably a curriculum breadth all sorts of things come together in those schools to make teaching tough and i mean i always hark back to the stories you know oh let's 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 parachute the best teachers into the struggling schools <laughs> that'll make a difference but in the meantime all the aspirant kids have gone out the back door yeah. to schools further up the ses ladder because enrollment shift in australia we talk about shift from public to private schools. That's a that's that's not completely the story. The the, the shift is from low SES to high SES schools, regardless of sector. And I'll go on about that later on. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and and I think that, that we then compound the issue because at least when the rhetoric changed from parental choice to sector blind needs based. Mm -hmm. Mm. It was a moment where you thought, well, all right, if we're going to have this situation where parents all want to put their uh, higher SES kids in the same schools and we've got these other schools that are dealing with the kids who already are the most disadvantaged, at least if we do needs-based sector blind, those schools will start to get the lion's share of the public funding, we might get smaller class yeah, sizes, yeah, yeah, we yeah, might yeah, actually yeah. get remedial programs, we might yeah, get, yeah, yeah. we might actually say we want the highest achieving teachers in those schools because yeah. that's the toughest end of it. We might actually mm. say, and, and we might actually make some of those low SES schools actually schools of choice because they become really uh, superb at what they do because we resource and help them to do that. Mm. But we didn't do that, even that. We didn't even no, do no, we didn't. that. We didn't do that. And look, Jane, let me, let me make one thing perfectly clear. We're not about blaming parents in the choices yeah. that they make, and that's not at all, not at all. I mean, you know, I've been through that as parents and grandparents, whatever, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation in homes. I understand that. But the system's wrong. The structure's wrong. And you can't blame parents for that. And you can't blame parents for, for wanting those choices. Well, in fact, what we do in the book, and we'll get to that probably later on too, is if by restructuring the system, we can actually, oddly enough, increase choice or make choice more widely or, and, and divorce choice from family wealth. Mm. And that means you, you create a situation where you're no longer stratifying your education system because, Jane, in every community in Australia, the independent school that happens to be in that community is enrolls the most advantage of the local population. In fact, it's ICSIA value on the my school website for the technically minded is about uh, 1,070, 1,075. 
Next in the pecking order is the local Catholic school, where across Australia, the average ICSIA is 1,035. Then down, down the rank is the local government school, where the average ICSIA is about 985. So it is a hierarchical system. Mm -hmm. It's a class-based system, whichever, you know, whatever loose yeah. way uh -huh. you define class. I mean, it's, it's a complex class-based system, mm. but that's what we have. Yeah, we have, and, and most- and it doesn't of... deliver. It doesn't it... deliver, uh, Jane. No, it, our educational achievements have been, as a nation, have been slipping, and they've been slipping since the year 2000 when the SES scheme was introduced by John Howard. Coincidence? Oh, probably. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, it's associated with it, Jane, with, with no cause and effect. Causation <laughs> is not, correlation is not causation, <laughs> let's say. Yes, indeed. And but it, it is not destiny, Julia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember well, that? Yeah. Yes, I Sorry, do. Sorry, Julia, it in actually Aus is. In Australia, it is. Disadvantage mm. is destiny. Absolutely, and it is. Unlike almost the rest of the world who, who use their education system to try and break down class systems, we use ours to try and create one. And worse than that, because I think there is hierarchies in all school systems that, you know, across the world you'll find inequalities, mm -hmm. you'll find mm -hmm. hierarchies. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we use the public funding not to close or to mm -hmm. minimise the hierarchy, we actually use it to drive and increase so, the so hierarchy. In the, remember in the 1980s in the United States, there was the busing, the controversy over busing. Yes, I remember and, that and it was busing, busing for equality. Yeah, I understand, you know, there's all sorts of issues applying. We bust for segregation. Yeah. We, we bust for something the reverse. Yeah. Which is quite remarkable. In fact, in, the, in New South Wales alone, I think the, pub, the transport the transport bill to carry kids from one side of Sydney to the other and, and other places, of course, is well, well above half a billion dollars this yeah. year. Can you imagine, just for a moment, let's imagine that, you know, you and I get to control the education system and change it the way we want to. And so most kids go back to going to the local neighbourhood school, public mm. school, free school, mm. primary and high school. Imagine how many kids would walk to school or bike to school. Imagine what that might do to their weight, their fitness, the traffic on the roads. If you want to see what the traffic might be like if most kids went to their local school, try yeah. school holidays. Everybody yeah, yeah. comments <coughs> about how the traffic, you know, evaporates. Yeah, because we haven't got all these... I'm sorry, I'm not as nice as you. Aspirational parents, I was going to use another adjective, but I'll say aspirational, um, bus, you know, driving their kids halfway across town to get them to a school that they think <coughs> is Look, going to give do. them something that the nearby they, one won't. They do. In fact, in Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide, uh, it's between 50 and 60%, I think, of kids in public schools. Mm. Let's leave the other sectors out for the moment. In public schools come from outside, outside the school's uh, drawing area that is yeah. absolutely that is huge that yeah. is massive and, and it's, um, it's ridiculous because you've probably got cars actually crossing as they go past each other one car taking the kid from their suburb to this suburb and another car taking this kid to here or both of them claiming that the schools they're leaving behind are terrible sins of yeah, iniquity yeah, you should yeah. never go near them <clears throat> and to the other one oh no highly desirable yeah. Purely because they're not do, next door. Yeah, governments are trying to do something about that. New South Wales government is tightening up on zoning, for example. Because I'd have to say, Jane, <clears throat> is that uh, it's not just the non-gov sector that's the guilty party here. Look, I went from being principal of a lower middle class secondary school to being principal of an upper middle class central school, a secondary school. Now, my capacity to discriminate in who I enrolled, my capacity increased substantially. Mm. Um, I didn't, and I wouldn't, but, you know, high-demand schools, high-demand public schools, I have to say, play a bit of this game. Hmm. And uh, in the book, we mentioned a couple of high-demand public schools, or one in South Australia in particular, that really has... And look, Northern Sydney is the same. My school was a comprehensive high school, but like all other, <laughs> all other high schools in Sydney, we became sort of pseudo-selective. In yeah. other words, we had the programs to attract the students that we would like to see walk through the door, that's not acceptable. And, yeah. and the funding, a funding system has to create advantages for schools that don't do that mm. and has to create penalties for schools that do. Mm. Yeah. Uh, private and public. Private but and public. Nevertheless, it is galling. At least 
the kids at the selective school in say North Sydney boys or Sydney girls or whatever, at least their funding remains more or less the same and probably less than their public funding. Mm. The, pu the public funding for a disadvantaged school in mm -hmm. the western suburbs of Sydney or in a mm -hmm. rural town. Mm -hmm. And, okay, there is still another inequality in that the wealthy parents of North Sydney boys and Sydney girls mm -hmm. or whatever can fundraise much more effectively than mm -hmm. the lower okay. FES parent body at another school. But at least the public funding doesn't act, does actually take that into account and mm. is different within the public system oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 for yeah. the higher SES <clears throat> and the lower SES schools. Mm. The problem with the independent system and the Catholic system, as the review that Catherine Greiner ran into the Catholic system and how it distributed its Gonski money discovered, they don't do that at all. In fact, they do Rather the opposite, Chris. They? <laughs> They've been caught out, been caught out about four times in the last half dozen eight years uh, by audits or inquiries of some sort, and including by the ABC when it blew this yes. up about three years ago. Um, <clears throat> yeah, look, the Catholic system is fascinating. They 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 feel the need to compete with the high fee Protestant schools, mm -hmm. and sure, there's some skewing. I, look, I don't know how much skewing of funding there is but certainly on all these occasions they found that uh, the funding was um, it was uh, badly directed um Gonski himself interestingly about two weeks ago said one of his regrets is that they allowed funding to go to systems to distribute as they wish and um they regret doing that and not having funding to all schools go to the specific schools yeah and i think that's a good observation yeah well, I mean, I think it is, um, I mean, it is galling to think that there are schools in this nation that charge 15000 20, $25,000, $30,000, $35,000, $40,000, dollars a year that are still receiving substantial amounts of money in public funding. Because one of the things that we do that is very unusual is that we give public funding to fee charging schools without saying to them you need to therefore cap your fees in return for the public funding you actually yes. have to have a lower <coughs> fee that yeah. you will charge and if you look, want to charge yeah. big fees you shouldn't yeah. get public funding yeah, it's look, pretty look, yeah jane you're right you're right look this was actually one of the weaknesses of the gonski review and um because i know I know they took the attitude that encouraging parents to pay fees added to the st total stock of resourcing for the school, ed school education in Australia. <clears throat> but that completely, completely ignored the regressive impact of fees, mm. uh, even static fees, let alone fees that were rising. So that remained unaddressed. It was unaddressed at the time of Carmel. It was unaddressed it was well it was actually addressed a little bit and carmel for those for those who don't know uh, oh, what sure. carmel yeah. was was a, a, re a review into schools uh prior to gonski what about 20 years prior yeah look James, the other thing is can i can i just read a little ex extract so Go there's, on, look there's this fantastic look it's absolutely a riveting book um <laughs> the, the um and can i say can i say that one of the comments about the book incidentally because because the middle three or four or five chapters are on the uh, political machinations after the Gonski Review came out. And um, my, my co-author, Tom, managed to turn what would be otherwise regarded as a tedious, uh, a tedious thing to write about mm. into, a, into a thriller. Oh, it so, is like a thriller. It's, it, 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 it's like a spy thriller. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, to show the mistakes, here's a quote from a, an academic who was commenting on the review, he said, the review contained no analysis of the social role of public schooling and of private schooling in its various forms, and no overt analysis of the relationships between the sectors. It failed to go to the roots of inequalities in schooling and can be shown to have exacerbated inequalities in education. Hmm. Now that's Simon Marginson, who's a well-known academic, but you know, he wasn't writing about the Gonski review, he was writing about the review back in the mid seventies. In other words, it was the same. Nothing changed. Those fundamental restructuring questions about school fees and the relationship between a private and public sector 
were just skirted over. It was too hard. And is it too hard, Chris? Is it too hard because it involves religious schools? Is that the core of, the, of our timidity, our trotting around, as you say, the elephant in the room? Is it because we've got this kind of, I don't know, fear of, of being seen to be sectarian, to go back to the old fights of the um, 50s and 60s, or we're being seen to be discriminatory in some mm -hmm. way? Or we're yeah. just not allowed to talk about it? Look, look, we don't talk about it. And we made a mistake right from the beginning. Look, in contrast to much of Europe and the Canadian provinces and so on, and Britain after the Second World War, we created a public system that was open to all children, <clears throat> but it never sufficiently met the expectations slash demands of, of Catholics in, in Australia. Now, you, there's two narratives about this. We can say, oh, well, the Catholics decided to take their ball and go and play another game. We can, we can say that. Or we can say that the concept of public education probably didn't go far enough to, to um, acknowledge that, uh, that church schools, in exchange for certain conditions, could be funded. Mm. <clears throat> now, this is a bit... This is a bit controversial in, in the sense that it's a different interpretation of the beginning of public education. But <clears throat> in the Canadian Constitution, uh, in, the, in, the Cana in the formation of Canada in 1867, they established Catholic schools, or the Catholic schools were established and funded as part of the state's provision of education. Now, the argument there is not to integrate Catholic schools into a public system. The argument now is to fully fund them, but in exchange for very strict conditions about what these schools are to do and, they, and to increase their, their responsibility for behaving and operating and obligations and so on in a public way. Now is the time we can do that because we know they're funded almost equivalent to public schools. We can now do that where we couldn't do it before. The only but, question... we, but, but that's different to public education. Mm. It's simply a series of schools that are now almost fully funded. Mm are asked to do certain things in exchange for that funding. That's right, like not be allowed to pick and choose what students they educate. Absolutely, not be allowed yeah. to flick the kid down the road to my school in the 1990s yeah. and whatever, you know? Yeah. So, but the only question I'd ask about that, Chris, is currently it would seem to me that the uh, Catholic system, along with the rest of the private fee-charging schools, they've got their cake and they're eating it. Oh, of Why? course. Right. Why would they want to? <clears throat> to oh, of course be fully funded in exchange for having would. to... Hey, hey and, and guilty, Jane, it's a wedge. It's partly a wedge. What a great position to be in, to offer full funding for Catholic schools and have an archbishop protest... Knock it back. ...vigorously and knock it back. <clears throat> the obvious response being, Archbishop, you mean you don't want poor Catholics in your schools? Mm. Would they knock it back? I don't know. It would certainly put the cat among the pigeons. And, and, look, would. and look, it's a challenge. Look, it's not, I don't mean that, I don't mean the wedge, it wasn't planned like that. But you see, these are the issues that we have to, grab, uh, to grapple well, with. These are the issues that the archbishops have, uh, have uh, the bishops have to grapple with. Well, because we already know, you and I know, that the majority of the poorest Catholics, in fact, almost in all schools. of them, of course they are. are in government schools, they're not in Catholic yeah, schools well, at all. Right, exactly right, yeah. And because the majority... to do otherwise, to, to do otherwise, <coughs> To do otherwise means finding some money, or yeah. or being or being uh, being uh, um, honoured, bestowed, whatever, anointed, to to be uh, exempt from fees or whatever. And look, they do they do a fair bit of that, but it doesn't change the enrolment profile of the Catholic uh, system. And they still they do it because the kids that they do it for um, add something to their marketing. Plan oh, Jane, look, look all these mechanisms, scholarships, whatever bursaries. Uh, they're, they're all selection methods, of course, yeah. and, 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 and selectivity um, in enrolment is, is absolutely rife in Australia. And, and we have to link funding to inclusiveness. Yeah, I think Until that's Until we do right. that, we're going to, our current problems are going to mount. And let me, let me tell you, they are mounting right now. They are. And we also have a situation uh, right across the board, interestingly enough, not simply in the public system, but right across the board, which seems to have been exaggerated by COVID, where teachers are leaving the profession in ever-increasing numbers and it's getting harder and harder to attract people to teach um, because 
we expect teachers, it seems to me, particularly teachers in disadvantaged public schools, to basically grapple with and overcome all of Australia's very wicked problems with poverty, with segregation, uh, with hierarchy, with a, with, a, with a huge class system that we won't even admit exists, um, and we pay them nothing. We give yeah, them yeah. few resources to do it with. We um, give them little respect. We don't, um, they're blamed whenever mm -hmm. the results go down, even though they're the only people struggling as hard as they possibly can to do something about it. <clears throat> and then we're surprised when they say, you know what, I think I'll go and do something else. We are getting to a crunch point, I suspect, in terms of our education system. And if we go on like this, Chris, I mean, you, you educated young people for decades, 40 years. If we go on like this, where we basically have some young people who have a sense of entitlement that it must be very hard to go out into the world in, with. I often half joke, you know, there's all those statistics about the fact that still kids from comprehensive public schools do better at university than both their selective and their private school fees appears at university this that research continues to be replicated and it's mm, the same mm. result every time <clears throat> i often half joke that the reason for that might be that it's a lot easier to go from one underfunded public institution to another, <laughs> to another underfunded another public institution <laughs> than going from some of those palaces of privilege because it always strikes me as weird particularly with neoliberal governments that they've they fund private schools up the wazoo. I mean, some of them are so luxuriously resourced now, surely the parents must feel a bit embarrassed. Um, <coughs> yeah, look, I'm look, sure the kids do. But yeah. the universities, yeah. they keep starving and cutting their, you know, they keep absolutely getting rid of academics, mm. getting rid of the research, you know, starving mm. them of funding, starving them the ability to do their job. And what's the point of spending all that money getting a kid into a posh private school if yeah. the end result is an impoverished university? Bizarre. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh that, that's exactly right. The, the, other, the other thing that's possible to do with restructuring is, just, is to cut these schools adrift. Mm. Yes, because very if wealthy you had, ones. Because if you had a system where <clears throat> you would be funded under certain conditions, Mm. Most of those high fee schools would cut themselves adrift. Yeah. They would become genuinely private schools, forming about oh about five percent, as they do in other equivalent countries. Yeah. So it would solve several problems. It would actually separate the school choosers from those who want, who authentically want, a religious slant perspective on their education of their kids, from mm. those who just want to be above and better and better endowed than others. So it, it would put, the, as I say, put the cat among the pigeons there, and um, we really have to seriously look at the options to achieve that. Well, I, I often think to myself that it's kind of marketing 101 that the market will charge what the market will bear. And when we subsidise the, when we publicly subsidise private supply and we put no cap on fees and we ask for no reciprocal obligations, it can only be inflationary. It can't bring the price down. It can only send the price up because <clears> what <throat> the private supply will do, we've seen it in childcare, we've seen it in first home buyer schemes, mm -hmm. and we see it in education, <laughs> oh, is yeah, they, yeah. they pocket the subsidy, thanks very much, and then they mm -hmm. go and charge the parents what they were going to charge them anyway. Yeah, well, that's so true. And of course, they if we don't... completely waste <clears throat> that public money, it gets us nothing. Yeah, look, it's that, actually, you can, you can quantify that too, Jane, because, because um, the different sectors, as long as you're comparing schools that are enrolling similar kids, the different sectors actually churn out much the same results. Yeah. Now, the schools do the, really well. Well, think of the possibility here, because every, every group of similar schools in Australia, you can identify the schools and the systems as the lowest cost provider to get these similar results. Now, almost, almost always it's the government system. Mm. It's the lowest cost provider. So what are these other schools spending more to get these same results? So that way you're able to calculate how much money governments and parents in this country waste. Yeah. And it adds up to, last time I did the calcs, it adds up to about $5 billion per year, round about half of which would be government funding. Can you imagine now, that's, that's, what that could buy? That, sorry? 
what that could buy, what that oh, well, five what billion you, could get us. <clears throat> well, you divert it to the to the uh, schools in the with the kids in the greatest need. Hmm. But it, you know, it's another it's another thing to think about when the police say, "Oh, we're spending so much money on education, but goodness me, the results aren't getting any better." because the measurable results aren't getting... Oh, look, they have other things, of course. They might have ex, ex swim pools and whatever, and drama rooms and all those things, all very good, uh, because they're locked in an arms race with competing schools anyway. Because <laughs> Parents absolutely. who can pay that kind of money. But it comes at a public cost as well as a private cost. Yeah. It strikes me we're within a few minutes of the end of our webinar and whether we should get some of the questions... Hannah, yeah. from the audience? You mean we should share this with other people? Okay. Oh, I guess so. All right. It's like a dinner party, Chris, where you and it I is. rave about it this is. stuff. A lot of diners. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Um, we only have a handful of questions in the Q&A. So um, folks at home, if you do have questions that you'd like to ask, um, please, please do share them in the Q&A because we would love to hear your questions and hopefully offer some insight for you. Um, be white in the uh, in the Q and A. Uh, you were talking a little bit earlier about how Australia funds private schools uh, so much compared to other countries. Um, are there any other countries or jurisdictions around the world that fund private schools to the same level that we do in Australia, or is this something that's unique to us? No, really, that's a really good question. That's a very good question. I, I really like the example of Chile in South America. <clears throat> there's a classic example of a country that went down the same road we went down through the 1980s, or post Pinochet, I was, <laughs> really, went through the 1980s into the 1990s, funding private schools without any conditions and allowing them to charge fees as they wish and whatever. But it's, it's the, the performance of that country uh, globally deteriorated rapidly. And from the mid 1990s, about the mid 1990s, they started to claw back what they were doing. And they started to establish conditions on private schools around the funding and the obligations that they should assume, et cetera, et cetera, cutting some of the funding, redirecting funding to, to public schools and so on and so forth. Now, we'll meet Chile coming in one, one direction as we head in the other direction. We might meet them halfway somewhere, but they're certainly still hell bent and it has paid off for them. It has paid off for them to focus the money on public purpose. In, in public schools and to claw back some of the huge concessions they are making to private schools. And as far as I know, Chris, there is no other country that does, that funds private schools in the way that we do. I think the Netherlands uh, have some public funding for private schools. There are other countries, not many, that have some funding for private schools. People are often surprised to hear that the US doesn't, that the uh, the British system does systems don't. Um, there are a few that have a small amount of public funding to, to private schools. New Zealand, for example, has the Catholic system as part of the public system, like Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so there are various um, different things. But no, we are the outlier, the absolute. We are charging ahead in the. Jane, I used to go to I, yeah, I used to go to conferences <clears throat> in my previous in my previous life. And you sit around with principals from other countries and that, that, they sort of ask you, well, how does the Australian system work? And you'd, <laughs> you'd explain it. And they'd be sitting there open mouth, golf yeah. They just could not, you, you mean, but they said that's sort of fraud, sort of, you know, like they're private schools. And we'd say, well, they sort of are, they sort of aren't. In financial terms, they're public schools or whatever. And, and they couldn't get their minds around that. And you'd always walk away thinking, you know, this is crazy. Hey, well, it's, you know, sometimes I think we're as blind about the damage that we're doing to our future via the way we um, fund schools mm. as Americans are um, it, about the harm, their, their loose gun controls or their lack completely yeah, gun controls. Yeah, are. Yeah. We just won't see the damage. It's the elephant in the room. No one will talk about it. But no, um, to be white, we are, we are alone out there. No one else in the world thinks what we're doing is a good idea. The problem is, is that the deficits we're accumulating are incremental. They're not sudden, they're not no. headline stuff, but it's, it's since the Gonski review, the data is showing we're heading in an awful direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was a bit shocked today. I mean, I shouldn't have been, really, that um, Morrison made a big proud announcement about giving $5 million 
to schools affected by the floods in the Northern Rivers area, but only private ones. Not well, the public like. ones. The public ones obviously had a higher elevation. Oh yeah, the they're public, always the, on the, the water, top of the, water, the hill. The water must have missed them. Yeah, you yeah. must have missed all the public ones. Sort of like <laughs> magic. <laughs> yes, we do that kind of bizarre stuff all the time. Mm. Is there another question? Oh, look, there's six. We've... Yes, oh, right. there are a few that have come Go on in. <laughs> we'll have brief answers from now on. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, uh, Gwen. Well, so while we're talking, we talked a little bit then about the um, the funding for flooded for the flooded schools up on the north coast. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Because most arguments on Twitter are saying this is the way the funding works, and this is something that I've been wondering myself. Because if you have a discussion about federal funding for schools, there is inevitably going to be someone coming in that says, "Well, actually, funding private schools is in the domain of states and territories, and independent schools are funded by." the federal government. <laughs> is that a good enough excuse? No. No. It's just, it's just evolved like that according to the ideological fantasies and preferences of various Commonwealth governments, basically. <clears throat> oh, that's not, that's not entirely fair. I mean, the Whitlam government could, could see a need for Commonwealth funding of, of uh, all, all sectors uh, to bring the, the, uh, the, the poorest schools up to scratch. But it's, it's, it's become an ideological battle ever since then. And it's not carved in stone. It's only legislation. We changed, look, you know, there were periods of time, okay, not in Australia after Federation, but certainly when the states were around, where women didn't have the vote. Oh, well, women can't have the vote. You know, we change legislation all the time. Yeah, um, of course we do. So yeah. we could change that. It's not carved in stone. And it's a get out of jail card, uh, free card. And it's mm. nonsensical. Why mm. should the federal government, which is the richest arm of government, able to get, gain the most amount of tax, fund the richest schools and yeah. leave the poorest <coughs> schools yeah. to the poorest arm of government? Particularly and, in the poor states like NT and um, and Tassie, they'll never be able to help their students enough if they have yeah, to rely yeah. only on the taxes that those country those uh, states can. Yeah, the gain. states are partly to blame here too, of course, because whenever okay. they receive whenever they receive Commonwealth funding, they say, "Oh, you beauty, I'll be able to save a bit of our own money." That's right; they uh, take it away from the public. <clears throat> in fact, the Gonski too, the revision to to uh, to the legislation in 2017 set up a system where the states are basically are basically fiddling the, the numbers to opt out of meeting their obligations. Yes. And this has always been the case. Yeah. We can't go on like that. Gosky recommended, of course, far closer cooperation between state and federal governments. We won't go far until we do that. Yeah. Uh, let's see, another question here is, how do you feel about the, the SES disparity sort of between public schools, parents who are paying like 200k more for a house because it's in a region where they can send their kids to one of the good, quote unquote, public schools? Yeah, look, there's a, there always, look, there always has been. <clears throat> there's always been a, 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 a difference in the, in, in the wealth and the SES of communities around New South, around Australia. We, we understand that. Around the world. <clears throat> around the world. But what we do, we put that system on steroids um, by the system of school choice in Australia. And yes, yes, it, it is a, an issue where um, uh, people are, are uh, moving house if necessary to get in the catchment of a higher SES school <clears throat> because they people inevitably, inevitably equate the quality of a school with, uh, or it ends up being equated with the SES of its enrolment. But um, sure, there's, and I live in a part of Sydney where some people tell some dreadful fibs to get their, to, about where they live to get their, their kids in, in one of the local schools. But look. Some people <coughs> tell some dreadful kid, fibs about the church they attend and the religion they believe oh, in. Well, I, I can't <laughs> imagine. I can't, no, no, I can't, can't imagine that. <laughs> um, sure. So, so the, it's a good question, and there's no easy answer. Mm. Well, you do, I mean, we, you've already spoken about a few possible solutions, Chris, in terms of what we could do to um, start to turn this beast around mm. in terms of um, tying obligations in return oh, yeah, for funding, for funding um, and, and <coughs> put in yep. fee caps and all those kinds yep, of yep. things. Yep. Um, and so it's not hopeless, but we have to find the political will to do it and we have to face the fact that we're using... Um, our school system to drive segregation and a class yeah, system. Yeah, and until yeah. we do that, we won't change. Have we time for any more questions, Hannah? 
I think we can maybe fit maybe one or two more in. Um, let's see, there's... Uh... Okay, yeah, Jamie. Jamie in, um, is from Toowoomba in regional Queensland. Um, they have three high schools there and it has um, a high population of culturally linguistically diverse kids, a high population of Aboriginal kids, high population of, of high needs kids in these schools. How can funding reforms actually work towards equalising this disadvantage and give schools with the greatest need, like in Toowoomba, the resources they need to adequately support these beautiful kids? Yeah, if the funding is genuinely <clears throat> based on the needs of the kids, that would have a substantial impact. Uh, and if it came along alongside a reduction of funding to those schools that go out of their way to enrol preferred students, that also would help to balance would help to balance the picture in large regional centres such as such as Toowoomba because regional centres in Australia are graphic illustrations of the inequality between schools and sectors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and let's see one more here with the, uh, this one has a lot of likes from Timothy. Can you give your thoughts? on the normalization of um, very offensive and inflammatory sort of comments through the ideological sphere, such as um, Stuart Roberts, who said uh, how uh, dud teachers don't go to independent schools, for example. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is this throat> becoming the new norm? Is this becoming the, the conversation around education? And yeah, that Marie, twas, twas ever thus. We, we can't all forget Christopher Pine, surely, surely. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, look. There's been a lot of dud education. Look, I think the best answer to your question is read my article in Pearls and Irritations uh, today. It came out today. Um, a dud minister blames dud teachers. Um, but, uh, but look, um, they, they go for the low-hanging fruit, especially new ministers. Go for the low-hanging low fruit, the easy things to do. Oh, we've got a new minister. Let's have a review of teacher training, for example. That's sort of, that's code for blaming teachers. And we've had... I think we've had 11 reviews of teacher training in the last, roughly on average, around Australia, one a year. Almost like royal commissions, they are. They're so frequent. And they do it because it's, it's, it's the low-hanging fruit. It's the easy thing to do. Blame schools, blame teachers, and avoid the really hard tasks. And to be honest, Stuart Robert, as I understand it, is a man of um, profound religious belief, and there is... No doubt at all, a bit of a culture war that's going on over the whole idea of secular education. Um, mm -hmm. We just saw, thank goodness, the New South Wales government reject Mark Latham's pernicious parental rights bill, which was all about forcing mm -hmm. public schools, secular inclusive public schools, to discriminate against transgender students. I mean, that was just mm -hmm. shocking and unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we should not also ignore another elephant in the room, which is we are dealing with ideological culture wars um, about conservative, often religious values, which people like Stuart Fon Robert fondly believe are being inculcated in um, independent schools, most of which I think 90 six percent of them are religious schools mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um it would seem they're not they're not very good at passing on the religion if um the latest figures on uh the number of people who claim to be religious in australia uh is any guide but mm. i think we have to admit that we have to accept that there is actually an underlying ideological reason for those comments as well it's not simply uh going for the low-hanging fruit or passing the buck mm, it's okay. actually ideological <clears throat> yep yep so let's um, let's finish up on maybe a hopeful and positive note. Um, Natalie asks, with a federal election coming, how hopeful are, are you both that funding arrangements will change in the future for for the better? <laughs> are we well, ending on a hopeful note, or yeah, no, yeah that's, that's we, a, we're two old stages. Oh God, and, and it's really true. James Wright, you know, we repeat history. Every, I mean, the political scenarios before Gonski and after Gonski are much the same. We go through this ritual. I would say at this election there will absolutely be there will be arguments about funding. They may even get into some sort of funding auction, but there'll be nothing about the structural changes are needed in the way we provide and resource schools in Australia. Nothing at all. 
uh, until there's a sort of a sufficient groundswell of discontent with what we have. So I'm not very hopeful. I don't see in either party any evidence that there's been a substantial rethink around the complex issues. One of the reasons that I'm standing for the Senate is because I think public schools need a voice. They need someone who stands up and makes the points that Chris has been making throughout this webinar to our politicians because they are so logical, they are so commonsensical, they are so important and I think they are embarrassing and they will embarrass the people in power when those arguments are made. And that kind of embarrassment and pressure has to happen. It has to happen because our children depend on it. The future of the most vulnerable of our children depends on those of us who understand this issue, getting loud about it and getting up in the faces of those who would give the money to their pet schools rather than looking at how do we help the neediest and most vulnerable children achieve their full potential. That isn't even a consideration in the way we plan our education system in supposedly egalitarian Australia. The land of the fair go, not if you're a kid in a poor family. It's the exact opposite of a fair go. But I have hope, I always have hope, that common sense will prevail, that teachers do an incredible job despite all the difficulties. The very fact that when you correct for SES background of students, we find that public schools perform at least as well as academically as these incredibly bloated, overfunded palaces of luxury and their students. That is a really hopeful sign, but we can't go on depending on the goodwill of teachers to maintain um, our education system. We all have to get behind it and we all have to get active in changing it. I've spent my life trying, I'm going to keep trying. If that's a hopeful note, well, there you are, you have it. Fantastic. And I don't see Chris stopping either. <clears throat> no, that's fantastic, Jane. And I think our viewing audience, audience can see why I really enjoyed working with you on those couple of books we did and all power to you. To well, ditto with you, Chris, ditto with you. And the latest book is excellent. It pains me to say so because I had nothing to do with it, but it's very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jane. All right. I think that is a, an excellent note to finish on tonight. Um, a, a glimmer of hope, perhaps, but also a call to action that we need to get behind people like Jane who are going to be forward thinking and pragmatic and commonsensical about funding education the way that it needs to be funded. Um, and on that note, I would like to remind you all, of course, um, the reason why we're doing this is because uh, Jane and myself, but Jane is our number one candidate running for the election for New South Wales. And if you would like to get involved, you can head to janecaro4reason.com.au. Um, that's a four, a number four. And if you would like to volunteer, if you would like to donate, I'm sure you all probably follow Jane on Twitter already. Um, keep in touch with what we are doing there in the campaign and follow along, because this is going to be a very important election indeed. Um, there's also a question in the chat. Will we be able to access this webinar later on? Yes, yes, you will. These all go up onto the Reason Australia YouTube page. Um, it will be up within the next day or so. So keep an eye on the YouTube page for that and of course before we finish Chris thank you so much for joining us tonight and of course where can people buy your book oh look at every good bookshop Hannah absolutely um, it's uh, it's certainly it's certainly out there um, uh, any questions uh, New South Wales uh, New South Wales press um, yeah I, I, I could write books I'm not very good at selling them actually but, but <laughs> no that's, they're certainly available is it New South who published it, Chris? New South. Absolutely. Yeah, New South. New South yeah, is yeah. the publisher. Yep. And I'm yep. sure you'll be able to get it at all good bookstores, Booktopia, QBD, yeah. Yeah, all comment, that. Whatever. Yep. The lot. Jamie <laughs> has bought Chris's book on Booktopia for $31. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, Jamie. Hey, that's pretty good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's almost better than an author's discount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, okie doke. Well, I think that might just wrap it up for tonight. Thank you, Good everyone, stuff. for joining us again. And of course, thank you, Chris, for coming in and offering us such valuable insight. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Hannah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. All right. All right. Bye. We'll see you all next week. Have a lovely week. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.